Okay, cool. Hey, y'all. Uh, how's it going? My name's Christy Free. I'm a, a math PhD candidate here at Georgia Tech. I'm going to be talking to y'all today about uh, Poincaré sections and sort of how do we uh, start reducing this dynamical picture um, in a way that we can sort of understand what's going on in the recurrent dynamics uh, in a more meaningful way uh, without necessarily losing too much information. So we talked about a lot of things on Tuesday. In particular, we talked about the notion of an orbit. So what you can imagine is that when we fix a certain dynamical system, we fix a certain dynamical flow, we get these long strands of spaghetti that sort of fill out through the space caused by integrating our dynamical system, right? And the idea is that if we're trying to keep track of every point and every evolution, there's a lot of information that we're actually doubling up on. Uh, so in particular, if we observe this orbit, notice that it's enough to know a single point on that orbit. And then assuming our dynamical system is a full dynamical system, that is to say that we can invert the flow as well, and it ranges over all of our, it's a flow, not a semi-flow, then this uniquely determines an orbit forward and backward in time completely, right? So for our purposes, uh, there's a lot of information which is captured by a single point. Um, so if we want to try and understand our map, a big strategy that we're going to be uh, continuing on throughout this time is trying to understand the meaningful parts of our map while quotienting out by the symmetries. Okay, And so in particular here, right, if we're looking at an orbit of these uh, full, con full time flows, we have a natural symmetry which is exhibited by simply shifting along that flow. If you consider the orbit generated by a single point through all, all of time, if you shift along that flow even slightly um, or by any amount, right, you still get the same orbit. So the really interesting part of the dynamics is actually what's happening across the orbit. Um, this is a term known as transverse to the orbit uh, or transverse to the vector flow. And what do I mean by that? Well, what we want to understand is not what's going on along a single flow, but how flows are evolving relative to one another. So maybe this is our, the, our sort of initial picture of what it crosses through, and then we want to understand what did the evolution along here. Okay, so the interesting part is not necessarily what's happening along that neutral direction, which is the direction of the orbit, but rather what's happening in all the other directions to our flow. That's what's telling us how these uh, these pieces of spaghetti, these orbits, are separating or contracting or twisting around one another, and we want to capture that information. Now, it's really, really hard to pick a single frame which sort of follows us around or follows a specific group of uh, strands of these orbits around through all of time, right? If you imagine, like, let's say that we go back to this picture right here, you would have to have a single set of coordinates, which sort of gives you transverse sections all along this. And you would have to somehow keep track of how those local coordinates, which are giving you these transverse directions, are changing with respect to time. Um, this can be done, but we're really making our lives very complicated by doing such a thing. OK, so one of the one of the structures that we can rely on uh, to help simplify this situation is a, an idea that we were talking about on Tuesday, which is the idea of recurrence. So instead of following my orbit and trying to pick a single coordinate frame, which follows along these strands of spaghetti for all time, what I can do is stick my foot in the ground, right? And then what I can do is I can observe all of the flows which go around all of space. And because of this recurrence, I expect that eventually they'll come back in time. Okay. So instead of trying to capture these frames and capture all the orbits, we're going to stick our foot in the ground pick a single 
section, okay? And we're going to get what's known as an induced map on that section. This idea goes back to the origin of dynamics, in particular the origins of geometry and topology in dynamics uh, in Poincaré. Poincaré. So in honor of that, we call these uh, hypersurfaces, these aspects that we wish that are, or not wish, we set up our flow to pierce through to be called Poincaré sections. Okay. Um, a few things to note about this is that these aren't losing any information, to be clear. We're not saying that we're forgetting about the rest of the flow. As long as you still acknowledge whatever dynamical system that you have, whatever flow that you have, you can always start uh, at a point in your Poincaré section and evolve forward in time, and you still get the full orbit picture. And in fact, if we restrict to uh, a non-wandering set and we restrict uh, to orbits that are within that non-wandering set, then all of those will pierce our Poincaré section at some point. So we really are capturing the full dynamics within that picture, um, as long as, again, we sort of rely on that recurrence. Okay? Okay. So, we know that if we could stick our foot in the ground and find this uh, ideal uh, thing, which our orbits will sort of continually cut through, maybe that would give us some information about how the orbits are evolving as a block throughout that time. Okay, so let's start introducing a few notions that are going to allow this to make sense. Okay, in particular, what we want to imagine is if this is some hypersurface, which just means that you can think about it as the graph of some function in three dimensions. Well, it's almost always, you can always think of it as a graph, I suppose, um, to a certain extent by uh, up to some non-degeneracy condition. But, but imagine it is like some sort of sheet in three dimensions, right? We can't do any better than that. What you want to imagine is that we want a, we want a notion that if, uh, we are at a point in the section that we don't main, we don't uh, stay in that section as we flow along the vector field, right? Because if we did, there's no meaningful notion to say that this point has a left uh, along the flow. Let's say that it was flowing, the vector field was along this direction, right? Then there's no meaningful way to say, okay, well, this point is leaving our surface according to the flow because it's actually flowing along the surface. Okay. So the way to get around this sort of um, degeneracy, this way of this idea that if you continue to flow along uh, whatever continuous time dynamical system that you have is a transversality condition. Um, now, what does transversality actually mean? Uh, the picture like I always keep in mind about what is transversality exactly is that we can imagine that if you had two parabolas, transversality is like if I uh, slightly shift these parabolas in either direction, they still sort of maintain their contact with one another. Okay, so this is like a robust uh, piercing in a certain sense. This is something that doesn't get destroyed by small perturbations. Whereas, so this is something that you would consider as transverse. Whereas something like this, where you only hit at a single point, this is not transverse, right? Because if I were to pull these parabolas apart, even slightly in this direction, this, they would break apart and there would no longer be an intersection. So this is non-transverse. So in some sense, you can think about this as a robustness condition. OK. OK, so we're computational people, right? We want to be able to actually do these things. We don't want to just have some fancy picture in our head. So how do we ensure when we're dealing with uh, some computational program that we actually have this sort of transversality picture? And the way to imagine that is that if this is some sort of hypersurface, and what does that mean? That just means that this is the graph of some function or it's just some um, co-dimension one manifold uh, 
Uh, what that means is that it's just one dimension lower than the space that it lives in. So imagine like a, um, a ball, right? A sphere with empty interior sitting in R3. That's a two dimensional object living in three dimensions. So that's co-dimension one, okay? Those are always going to have an associated normal vector, right? This is something you may have seen before. So the simplest example to sort of illustrate this picture is uh, an example that we use a lot in the homework, and I'm sure we'll see many times because they're really uh, elegant and simple ways to check these transversality conditions, is the idea of a plane. So if you imagine I have some plane here, right? How do we define a plane? We define it with a normal vector and a point. So we always have some vector which is sticking out of our plane. Okay. And the idea with the transversality condition is just exactly the idea that we want to be flowing somewhere along this normal vector. Okay. So if we're somewhere, if we have some component which is along this normal vector, then we're flowing through the surface and we have this transverse intersection. And if we are flowing completely perpendicular to it, then we are flowing along the surface and that's not transverse anymore. We now no longer have a transverse intersection. So this is a transverse. This is not transverse. Okay. And the way we, uh, we set that up computationally is just saying that if we have some normal vector, okay, associated to our plane, you can extend this to any hypersurface using the gradient if it's a level curve of some function, okay? Dotted with our vector field at the point, right? This is not equal to zero. So if the dot product is not equal to zero, that means that there is at least some component either along this normal vector or directly against it. Which means that we're not flowing within the surface or within the plane. But we can't have this Poincaré section just work at one point, right? That, that's, that's completely useless, right? We want this to be some sort of global object which we continuously reference and we don't want it to work and then you come back around and it works and then it come back around and it works and then you come back around and it fails. So we want to make sure that this condition is held across the entire surface. So if you can imagine, this is some sort of plane and maybe there's some section over here where if I consider n dot v, right? It's positive on this portion of the plane. And then on this portion of the plane, n dot v is negative, right? We're not gonna prove this, but uh, these things, these are continuous functions of the argument along the surface. So what you can imagine is if you picked a point that had n dot v is positive, and you float along to this point where it's negative, at some point, you're gonna cross a region where it's exactly zero. Okay? So that's a big issue for us, because again, we don't want it to work in special cases, we want it to work everywhere. So the way we're going to get around that is by requiring that not only this be non-zero, but it be a particular sign. Um, in our case, we're just going to pick that to be positive. Um, there's not an incredible reason to do that. Um, as long as you pick a single sign, it doesn't, it's enough. Um, but for our conventions, we're gonna pick positive, okay? So not only are we gonna require that our Poincaré sections be non-zero, but we're also going to require that they be positive. Okay. 
Any questions so far on what a Poincaré section is or what are some properties that we might want out of this? So I, I see how this uh, construction is mathematically desirable, that you want the sign to be greater than zero, but from a practical standpoint, like computationally, yeah. um, could you just track every time it goes through the section and then if it's not positive, just ignore that intersection? Is well, because it... so part of the problem is going to be that um, we are going to want this section to uh, work no matter what your initial condition is. So it's not so much from a from a practical perspective what the sign is that matters. It's that I want to make sure that uh, let's say that like I pick a random section, right? Just totally arbitrarily. And I happen to pick it where right along here it flows along my section instead of out of it. Right. So let's say I, I, I blindly picked and I happen to pick a section where it flows along it instead of across it. Sure. Okay? Then there's no meaningful notion of what uh, the return time or what uh, the the next point in the map should be. Right. Because what's happening is that I'm coming in here and then I'm flowing along and I'm exiting here. So if I wanted to, to set up some sort of meaningful notion of a Poincaré map, I would have to send this entire segment to wherever this goes next. And theoretically, if I set up my Poincaré section really poorly, right, it could never leave the surface, in which case I don't even have a map at all. So um, the, the idea of uh, making sure that we have this non-negativity, this transversality condition, is really making sure that for every point in our Poincaré section, we have a well-defined notion of the next point. Does that make sense? That makes sense. I, I guess I was just asking if, like, if when you're going to implement a Poincaré section, do you actually have to check mathematically that this condition holds, or can you just have the computer sort of do it in real time? And um, so so yes and no. So um, so so okay. So theoretically, you could run the simulation without uh, checking um, that the Poincaré map was well defined. Um, and, and theoretically, even um, the, the Poincaré map could be ill-defined on a very, very small portion of your space. So that, again, kind of the same thing we were talking about earlier, where, um, you know, when you're dealing with a computer that doesn't actually have every point, it's dealing with, like, intervals. Theoretically, you could pass through. Um, but at that point, you are really just relying on dumb luck. Um, and sometimes dumb luck will work, uh, but we don't want to have to rely on dumb luck gotcha. uh, for this to work. All right, thanks for, thanks for that. Yeah, no worries. No, I also think it's very cheap, God, to just take a dot product once you're in a cross section. Computationally costs you nothing. Yeah. So it's not a big deal, but. Um, Technically, we want to just add this assumption and you, you can run without this assumption, but um, you are kind of going into uncharted territories at that point. OK, any other questions? Cool, so so what is this helpful for? OK, so I've, I've told you that we pick some random hypersurface or some particular hypersurface that we maybe choose very intelligently. Um, and maybe it has lots of nice properties and very good things about computationally and maybe all that's great. But what do we actually get to do with it? Right? Okay. So what's the idea? So the idea is that if I have some plane and I have some flow which pierces that plane and then maybe it comes around and it pierces it again. OK. Well, as long as we have this transversality condition and we have a certain amount of recurrence to make sure that we do eventually come back, what we can imagine is just I can look at the iterates of this map on the Poincaré section itself. 
Okay, so that gives us a few um, quantities which are really useful. So the first thing is uh, the return time for a given point on our Poincaré section. Okay, and what does this return time actually mean? It just means how long did you flow in this outer region before you came back and you pierced the Poincaré section? So if I lay down a given Poincaré section, I have no idea necessarily how long it takes for me to come back. If I have a certain amount of recurrence, I know I will come back, I just don't know when. So to every point, I can associate a given uh, recurrence. I can associate a given return time. So this is a return time. And the other thing that I have is I have an induced map on the section. So what does that mean? I have P, let's call this right here U. Okay. You can even have it be um, the level set of some functions. So maybe this is U of X is equal to zero. Okay. I guess let's call that S. X such that U of X is zero. Okay. So this is just parameterizing our Poincaré section by the levels curve of some, or the level set of some function. I get a map from P from S to itself which satisfies many of the same relationships that we remember about the flow. Okay, so if in particular, if the flow is invertible, then this exhibits an inverse. If flow is invertible, and it obeys uh, the same properties as we ex uh, exhibit for uh, flows. In other words, if you flow forward and you look at the Next time you pierce, so let me continue drawing. And then I'm going to pass underneath this one. Come back, pass through. OK. This is P2 of X. This is P of X. And this is X. If we iterate our map twice, it's the same thing as iterating our map once and then iterating it again. This may seem like a sort of a triviality just from the physical picture, but it really is a, a sort of fundamental notion that we're going to use. Okay. Um, and just as a short digression, I'm just going to talk about like what do we even mean when we say these maps? So whenever we have a finite map, all we're saying is that we have some space usually equipped with some structure. So maybe it's topological, maybe it's measure theoretic, maybe it's whatever has some structure. And we have our map from it to itself, right? And then we can ask if I give a rand, uh, a point x in x, right? I can ask, OK, what are the iterates of this map? Where does this map map to? So I can look at x, p of x, p squared of x, so on and so forth. And this is exactly what's called the orbit of our point X. So this is exactly the same idea as that orbit that we had for continuous time flow. It's just that because we have these discrete mappings in between, instead of having some long piece of spaghetti, we just have a list of places that it visited. 